Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this session of Religious Liberties Practice Group's uh, breakout panel. My name is Bill Saunders. I am the chairman of the Religious Liberties Practice Group. And uh, I, uh, as I say, I welcome you here. I appreciate all the interest the members have in this uh, subject matter. And I encourage you to join the practice group. Um, again, it's easy to do online, or you can see me, or you can see Dean. So I just want to invite you to get more involved. And I will turn it over now to our moderator, Judge Bea, who will introduce the panelists. Judge. Well, um, I'd like you to, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's panel. We've got some distinguished professors to discuss both the pro-religion and perhaps the separation uh, side, and it's a typical uh, good uh, federal society, federal society group. You get both sides. Um, today, the panel will address, and I'm sorry I have to read up here, but the lights are very bright. The panel will address the meaning of the American Legion versus American Humanist Association decision case regarding the Bladensburg Peace Cross in New Jersey and where the court is headed next. Has the Lemon Test been completely or at least partially overruled? And if so, what do we anticipate the guiding principles will be going forward in Establishment Clause cases? This question has particular salience in light of the court's upcoming case regarding funding for religious schools in Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. Finally, to what extent do we think the court will or should interpret the Establishment Clause to place strict limits on government's ability to protect religious exercise that causes harm to third parties, including dignitary harm? Such a question may be relevant to pending cert petitions, including in Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, a case dealing with faith-based adoption agencies' inability to certify same-sex couples for foster care. Leading off today's discussion, a presentation will be uh, Professor Stephanie Barkley, who is an associate professor of law at the J. Reuben Clark Law School at Brigham Young University. She will briefly touch on a recent article she co-authored that used corpus linguistic tools to evaluate the historical support for different theories of Establishment Clause cases. She'll also talk about recent legislature, legislation like the Do No Harm Act, which has passed the lower house of Congress, and arguments made by thoughtful scholars like Micah about certain third party harms preventing religious exemptions under the Establishment Clause. She'll be followed by Mr. Luke Goodrich, who's Vice President and Senior Counsel, Beckett and Adjunct Professor at Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. Mr. Goodrich will explain the Supreme Court's decision in American Legion, the Bladenburg Cross case, and that it strikes another major blow to the often maligned Lemon versus Kurtzman test and signals a return to a more historically grounded approach to interpreting the Establishment Clause. He'll flesh out the historical approach, what the historical approach means for other major Establishment Clause cases. He'll be followed by uh, Bill Marshall, uh, who is the William Brand Cannon Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina Law School. Bill will discuss the Roberts Court decisions in the Establishment Clause standing Specifically, he will address whether the Arizona Christian School Tuition Organization versus Wynn case and the concurring opinion of Justices Thomas and Gorsuch in the Cross case, in the Bladensburg Cross case, uh, or at least some of the justices are moving to not only limit the access of Establishment Clause plaintiffs to federal court, but whether they are seeking to use standing doctrine to redefine the con what constitutes an Establishment Clause case. If time permits, uh, he will also discuss uh, what, what happens in, if a state chooses to fund religious organizations on the same basis as it funds parallel non-religious organizations, uh, 
and a possible new conclusion that there may not be an establishment clause violation even where the state funds religious organizations more favorably than it funds parallel non-religious organizations. The cleanup hitter is uh, Micah Schwartzman, who's a, <coughs> who's a, a professor uh, at the uh, Hardy Cross Dillard Professor of Law uh, at the University of Virginia Law School. Now, before they present their, their views of the Bladensburg Cross case, I'm using a point of personal privilege to give you what is the rule of result. What results will you get in cases where there are um, religious symbols in the public square? Uh, this is the theory I've developed and which you as practitioners can take to your clients with sure predictability of result. You have to consider four cases. One is Lynch versus Donnelly, which involves the placement of a crash nativity scene in a park outside in uh, Rhode Island. And that was held not to be a violation of the establishment clause. A crash placed inside a courthouse in Allegheny County was found to be a violation of the Establishment Clause. Now I'll turn to the Ten Commandments cases. The Ten Commandments graven on an obelisk outside a Texas library in a Texas park was found not to be a violation of the Establishment Clause. The same text on a parchment inside a Kentucky courthouse was found to be a violation of the Establishment Clause. From this, the rule of decision and the rule of result is very simple. If the monument gets rained on, it's okay. And there's a roof over it, it's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I'll feed to Professor Barkley. Mr. Goodrich. We're keeping you on your toes. We're just going to switch spots. <laughs> well, thank you, Judge Bea, for that kind introduction. I'm very glad that we are indoors so that religious expression is safe uh, and not getting rained on here. Uh, thank you for the Federalist Society for having me on this great panel and for all of you for being here today. I'm especially happy to be here today because I come to you bearing good news. The future of the Establishment Clause is looking bright because the future of the Establishment Clause will increasingly focus on the history of the Establishment Clause. To unpack that, I'm going to very briefly do three things. First, I'll highlight a very significant shift that's taken place in the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, away from the subjective lemon test and toward a more objective historical approach. Second, I'll describe what this historical approach may look like in practice. And finally, I'll explain why this is such good news. So first, what is this shift that has taken place? If you know anything about the Establishment Clause, you know about the three-part lemon test, which asks courts to examine the purpose, effect, and potential entanglement of any government action. You know this test has been criticized for decades by folks like Judge Bea for producing inconsistent results. And you know that Justice Scalia once compared it to a ghoul in a late night horror movie that stalks the Supreme Court's Establishment Clause jurisprudence even after it seems to have been repeatedly killed and buried. And that analogy is apt because as much as the Supreme Court criticized the lemon test, it never offered anything to replace it. So lower courts have felt bound to apply the lemon test and lemon has kept wreaking havoc. The good news is this, the court has finally offered an alternative to the lemon test in the form of a historical analysis. We see this most recently in American Legion, where the court, by a seven to two vote, upheld the display of a Latin cross on government land. A four justice plurality, which included Justice Breyer, expressly rejected the lemon test and said it was adopting, quote, a more modest approach that looks to history for guidance. Justices Gorsuch and Thomas didn't join that opinion because they actually wanted to go even further. 
but they agreed overall with a historical approach. So you now have six justices saying Lemon is wrong and the court needs to focus on history. The shift toward history, however, uh, wasn't invented in American Legion. It's been happening for quite some time. In 2014, in the town of Greece decision involving legislative prayer, a majority of the court also refused to apply Lemon and said, quote, the Establishment Clause must be interpreted by reference to historical practices and understanding. Nor is this historical approach a 21st century innovation. Many of the court's earliest Establishment Clause cases, like Everson, McGowan, and Walls, were all self-consciously rooted in a historical approach. So the historical approach is not new, but the fact that a majority of the court has now rejected Lemon and offered a historical approach as a replacement mark a very important shift in Establishment Clause jurisprudence. So what is this shift to a historical approach going to look like in practice? Given the multiple opinions in American Legion, there's still some work to be done to flesh this out, but it helps to start with a solid understanding of what constituted an establishment of religion at the time of the founding. Unfortunately, this is not a particularly controversial question uh, because nine of the 13 colonies had established churches and we know what those entail. Professor McConnell has identified uh, six key elements of an establishment at the time of the founding. The first was government control over the doctrine and personnel of the church. These were laws like the Acts of Uniformity in England prescribing the articles of faith of the established church and regulating who could be appointed as clergy. Second element of establishment was mandatory attendance in the established church. So you actually had laws punishing people for failing to attend worship. The third element was government financial support of the established church. These were transfers of money or land grants exclusively for the support of the church. The fourth element was restrictions on worship in dissenting churches. The fifth was restrictions on political participation by dissenters. And the final was the use of the established church to carry out government functions, like giving churches authority to prosecute moral offenses. Once we understand what actually constituted an establishment at the time of the founding, we're in a much better position to see what a historical approach to interpreting the Establishment Clause might look like. Rather than asking why, uh, whether some hypothetical reasonable observer might think the government is endorsing religion, as the courts had to ask under the Lemon Test, courts can instead ask whether the challenged government action shares the characteristics of an establishment at the time of the founding. As applied to the cross in American Legion, the answer is clearly no. The cross didn't control religious doctrine or compel religious observance. It didn't subsidize a church or penalize dissenters. It just sat there, and anybody who didn't like it could simply ignore it. Uh, this historical approach also has very important implications for other areas of Establishment Clause jurisprudence, like funding, uh, religious expression in public schools, and religious accommodations, and we'll get into some of that today. Uh, but the other piece of good news is that lower courts are already starting to flesh out what this historical approach can look like in practice. Uh, Judge Brennan on the Seventh Circuit recently applied a historical test in upholding a long-standing tax exemption for the housing of ministers. And Judges Hardiman and Bebus on the Third Circuit recently relied on a historical approach to uphold a county seal that included a Latin cross. Uh, you wouldn't have seen these decisions a decade or two ago, and these are important indicators of better things to come. So in closing, I'll offer three reasons why the shift to a historical approach is good news. First, a historical approach offers a more objective basis for resolving Establishment Clause claims. We all know Lemon was basically a Rorschach test with the reason reasonable observer always ending up looking like the judge who held the deciding vote. <laughs> Uh, histor a historical approach, by contrast, requires courts to compare challenged governmental actions to known historical practices. Uh, second, a historical approach actually does a better job of making sense of existing case law. Uh, one example would be school prayer, like in Ingle versus Vital. The prayer there was problematic not necessarily because it endorsed religion, but because the government 
was controlling religious doctrine by composing an official prayer, and it was compelling religious observance by pressuring school children to say it. Uh, the historical approach also makes better sense of decisions on funding, on testos, and delegation of government power to religious groups. Uh, so you don't need the made-up lemon test to give meaningful content to the Establishment Clause. And finally, the historical approach is more faithful to the underlying purpose of the religion clauses, which is to leave religion as untouched by government power as possible. In the private sphere, this means the government doesn't compel religious observance, punish religious dissent, or prop up a favored church. It leaves religion free to flourish according to the zeal of its adherents. And in the public sphere, this means the government doesn't tear down religious symbols or pretend that religion doesn't exist. Instead, it recognizes religion as a natural part of human culture, just like race, ethnicity, and sex are natural parts of human culture. In short, the historical approach provides a more objective analysis that is faithful to the text, history, and purpose of the Establishment Clause. And the best news of all is we can finally bury the zombie of lemon once and for all. Thank you. Professor Barkley. I'll echo Luke's um, thanks to Judge Bea and the Federalist Society and Bill Saunders and, and for all of you for being here and being interested in this topic. I think Luke has done a great job describing some of the shifts that we have seen the Supreme Court engage in with respect to its jurisprudence. And, and the court's establishment clause jurisprudence, I think, has needed some work and some revision for some time. Um, to use the legal term of art that Judge Newsom described, um, our establishment clause jurisprudence has been, quote, a hot mess. Uh, and so I think some of these historical shifts um, are are bringing welcome clarity to this area of the law. The, I want to talk about three different things today, adding a little bit more description to what, what, the, what the test might look like um, in the historical context and how that might differ from what the court was doing before under Lemon. I'm also going to discuss briefly um, an important theory that um, my colleague Micah Schwartzman is going to be discussing as well as far as how should we think about harm to third parties under the Establishment Clause. And then I'll touch just very briefly on standing. So for the historical shift, um, one thing that I think is valuable about that is that in the past, one reason Lemon failed is we have this abstract test at a high level of generality that's trying to control all of the different situations that would arise in Establishment Clause context. And it turns out that establishment is a multi-layered term with a lot of different meanings. Um, and I think we're, what we're more likely to see the court doing is adopting different approaches for each of the unique hallmarks of an establishment. And Luke has already mentioned some of the scholarship, the really important scholarship that Professor Michael McConnell has done looking at some of those hallmarks. One thing that, um, that I wanted to do along with some co-authors, including Annika Boone, who's in the room, and Brady Early, is we wanted to take some of the tools of corpus linguistics and see does that provide any more information about what some of these historic hallmarks might look like or might, uh, might suggest. We've already had some great historical analysis sort of diving deeply into some of the debates about the Establishment Clause or different historical analogs, but how were people talking about it? If we search large databases of newspapers or speeches at the time, how are people referring to the term establishment? Um, in the context of a church and state establishment. And it turns out that aside from establishing one designated illegal or legal church of the state, which was uh, quite prevalent in, in our results for what people were talking about, we also found a lot of support for the idea that government would be coercing or persecuting dissenters who weren't participating in the established church's um, religious practices government was trying to control the leadership or the doctrine of the church. Um, government was interfering with um, the church in that way. They were providing preferential public support of established churches. And then they were restricting the ability to participate in civic or political participation based on lack of membership to the established church. 
And with the public support piece, um, it was interesting that every time we saw this example come up, it wasn't just the fact that government was giving support or funding to an established church. It's that it was doing it in a, in a directly preferential way. And we didn't find any support for the idea that there would be concerns about government display of religious symbols. In fact, when that did come up a handful of time, the concern was about government tearing down symbols of dissenting churches that were not established churches. And I think the Supreme Court's decision in American Legion uh, is at least consistent with that idea. There's a line about how if government were roving across the countryside, tearing down uh, religious symbols, that looks like a government hostile to religion, not a government that's being accommodating of religion. Um, we didn't find support for the idea that religious exemptions would be problematic. Uh, and we, of interest, I think, in the context of education, the only example we found about that um, discussed the fact that in England, only the established church could have ministers or leaders who would teach in school. So the problem wasn't the idea that there would be any sort of religion involved in schools. The problem was that um, only the established church had that privilege. Moving to the third party harm point, this is um, a theory that has, I think, really gained traction in some circles. Um, there is legislation called the Do No Harm Act that has been uh, introduced in the House, and we can talk a little bit more about that later if that comes up. But the idea driving behind this theory is that the Establishment Clause prohibits religious exemptions or religious accommodations if they result in harm to third parties. And what harm means is, is defined differently by the legislation or by um, some of the scholars who are advancing these theories. So I'll just offer really quickly three reasons why um, I think that this, this theory is not likely to gain purchase and I think would be a, a problematic way to interpret the Establishment Clause. And one case where you might see this come up is in the pending uh, cert petition, if the Supreme Court decides to take it up, um, of Fulton and versus the city of Philadelphia. This is where there are Catholic adoption agencies who uh, the city decided to n not renew the contract with to allow them to continue serving the city's vulnerable foster children because of the Catholic agency's beliefs about marriage and their inability to certify um, unmarried couples or same-sex couples. Even though uh, at this time when, when the city shut down that contract, no same-sex couple had actually ever asked the Catholic Social Services to perform such certification. One argument that was made in the lower courts is that if the city accommodated Catholic Social Services, that would violate the Establishment Clause because it would be potentially imposing um, harm or a burden on these third parties. So why, why do I think that that's problematic? As a doctrinal matter, the Supreme Court seemed to suggest fairly clearly in footnote 37 in Hobby Lobby that while harm to third parties is part of the analysis, it, it's baked into the type of analysis we consider in strict scrutiny analysis when we're considering the government's interests and the alternatives government has to advance those interests. But it doesn't operate as a strict bar on the ability to protect religious organizations. Otherwise, we would be essentially saying that religious rights never matter and are always defeated as long as there is essentially anything more than a de minimis harm on the other side of the scale. Um, also, Calder, one of the leading cases that is relied on for this proposition, was originally decided under the court's Lemon precedent. And uh, as I think Luke described, Lemon is really questionable precedent to rely on anymore. And as a historical matter, our country long recognized accommodations for religious individuals even when sometimes they were very costly. A really famous and uh, prominent example is the fact that we exempted Quaker individuals from being drafted in the military because of the pacifist religious beliefs of the Quaker individuals. That was a costly accommodation. Someone else had to take their place and had to go fight. And yet, we realized as a country that forcing them to fight wasn't really accomplishing anything. There were some uh, historical quotes at the time when we're penalizing these Quaker individuals, sometimes uh, sending them to jail or in engaging in even harsher punishments. It's not actually encouraging them to fight, so we're punishing good citizens that could otherwise be contributing in a valuable way to our country. Uh, and, and so we're adding to human suffering without actually benefiting our country. And I guess the final normative point on this issue is that 
as uh, law and economic theorists have long recognized, every time you protect a right, it resolves or it results in externalities to third parties. This is something that Ronald Coast observed long ago, where he said, "quote Exercising a right um, is always resulting in a cost to society." That's something that um, more recently professors like Professor Holmes and Sunstein have again reiterated, and. What this means is that any time we hold a right as important and fundamental, if we say we're only willing to protect it if there's no cost to society, what we're really saying is we're not will willing to protect it. That doesn't matter to us because rights are costly. Freedom of speech is a costly right. Freedom of speech is a, is a right that often results in harm to third parties, including dignitary harms. And we embrace that as a country because we realize that the benefits of protecting those rights are critical to being able to have the type of free nation that we want to have. And finally, the last point is that um, Justice Gorsuch did suggest in his concurrence that he thinks it would be valuable to bring the Establishment Clause jurisprudence more in line with how we think of standing in other contexts. Uh, he asked about, it, it, in other contexts, we certainly can't imagine, he said, if a bystander was disturbed by a police stop and they tried to sue under the Fourth Amendment, or if an advocacy organization whose members were distressed by a state decision tried to deny someone a civil jury trial if they sought to complain under the Seventh Amendment, or envision a religious group upset about um, application of the death penalty, trying to sue to stop that, does anyone doubt that those cases would be rapidly dispatched for lack of standing? And his point is that uh, the Establishment Clause way in which we have thought about standing has long been an anomaly, and that's another area where we could possibly bring that back in line with the way in which we treat standing for many of our other rights under the Constitution. Thank you. Marshall. Thanks. Let me begin by thanking Judge Bay and really terrific panelists. Um, also, let me thank the Federalist Society. Uh, I am so grateful to the Federalist Society for inviting card-carrying members of the American Constitution Society like myself and Micah, we live in a world in which conversations across party lines is a little bit too infrequent. I was uh, reading something recently that Democrats don't want their kids marrying Republicans and Republicans don't want their kids marrying Democrats. My dad was a conservative Republican. My mom was a liberal Democrat. I take this personally. <laughs> I wouldn't be here if people were not talking across party lines. Of course, I later realized, as I'm sure you all would, that my mom was so much smarter. But that's, <laughs> but, but that's, but that's another story. Uh, I'm going to talk about Establishment Clause standing, picking up where Stephanie left off. I'm going to be talking about standing, so this is a good time to pull out the pillows or whatever you want to do, because I'm going to talk about procedure, and you can all fall asleep during the middle of it. But if there's any dramatic area where the Roberts Court seems to be going, it is in standing. In the Hind case, the court said, without overruling Flast versus Cohen, because Stephanie is right, that we've had much broader rules in standing and establishment clause areas than in other areas, but without, but without ruling directly Flast versus Cohen, the court said, well, there's no standing to challenge congressional grants of monies to religious organizations, excuse me, executive grant of money to religious organizations. Uh, only Congress is mo giving money to Exact to our religious organizations. Try to try to get your hands around that one. Then in the Wynn case, what was, what was at issue was a grant program in which a taxpayer could pay money uh, pay money to a organization that was primarily funding religious schools, and the court said that was distinguishable from from Flast as well because the taxpayer wasn't directly paying money to the government and handing it out although this was a dollar-for-dollar dollar tax credit. Um, this would make no sense economically to try to distinguish between the two. As a matter of fact, uh, the, rem the uh, bill for religious assessments that Madison criticized in his remonstrance had a similar kind of provision. If you didn't want to support a church, you could pay money elsewhere, but Madison still felt that that was a direct violation of what establishment principles should be. And then in the American Legion case, Justice Gorsuch and Thomas did exactly what Stephanie said, suggesting that we really ought to take this kind of broad establishment standing away and kind of treat the establishment clause like other provisions. Well, first of all, two practical aspects of that. One is the grant decision in, um, 
in, uh, in Wynn is basically an instruction of how to avoid establishment clause scrutiny. Instead of taxing and then giving the money to a religious organization, just give the money to the organization directly in a, in a dollar for dollar credit and you avoid kind of constitutional scrutiny. So if the, gov if the city wants to build a church, the way that they can do it is structure a grant program as opposed to a taxation program. The American Legion decision, if Gorsuch and Thomas's opinion is to be taken seriously, would suggest that nobody would have any standing to challenge new monuments, although the decision itself by the majority was suggesting there might be a distinction between new monuments and old monuments, so there'd be quite a difference in, in, uh, in, the, in what results there would be, and all of you, and many of you, I'm sure, are saying, great, this is terrific. But let me indicate why this might not be so terrific. One of the reasons why establishment clause standing is different than other kinds of standing is because the establishment clause is different. It doesn't really create individual rights. It creates a sort of broader, broader prohibition. And many of the principles that we see it, that the establishment clause is trying to enforce are, are, are of what Justice Scalia called psychic harms and what what uh, Justice Gor Justices Gorsuch and Thomas were trying to take away from standing. For example, the harm to taxpayers that Madison was concerned about was a conscience harm. It was that your conscience was being harmed if you saw your money going to religious groups and religious teachings that you didn't, that you didn't support. Um, most justices believe that denominational preferences are improper, but that's also likely to be just a psychic harm. If, a, if an organization says we are, uh, we are, our town is, is Presbyterian and we celebrate Presbyterianism in our town, then the Baptists are suffering only psychological harm by that, by that particular declaration, yet one would, one would assume that that kind of explicit government preference for one religion creates some sort of establishment problem Again, this would be immunized from judicial review by, by these standing decisions. Um, coercion. Um, if you define coercion the way Justice Scalia does, uh, or did, uh, you know, normally I come here and defend Justice Scalia because I'm protecting the Smith decision, but, and you guys are all critical because I know you don't support a lot of what Justice Scalia had to say. But here I'm going to come back and sort of suggest Justice Scalia was missing was missing something here. Um, you know, the, uh, w with respect to coercion, he thought that coercion just meant under legal penalty. In, in Lee versus Weissman, though, as you all know, Justice, Justice Kennedy drew it a lot broader and said basically fear of social ostracization is, com is the kind of coercion against which the Establishment Clause protects against. Well, that is also simply a psychic harm. It's not a tangible harm um, that uh, that you might see in other standing cases. Uh, Anti-corruption, um, Luke was referring to the notion in Engel, he's exactly right, that Engel was largely concerned about the fact that it was the government involving itself in religion by drafting a prayer. But the idea of corruption of religion, that is a psychic harm. That is, that, that religion itself is being corrupted, it's not a tangible harm, or if it is, the only folks who are getting harmed by that are the people who get the benefit of the government's support. And one would think that they would not be appropriate plaintiffs to have standing. And finally, there is the alienation of outsiders concern that Luke was talking about that has been used with respect to challenges to monuments. But uh, if, if we suggest there's no standing on that basis, you're suggesting that also is not a legitimate part of what the Establishment Clause is all about. And let me point out, by the way, I'm only talking here about standing. I'm not talking about the results. When Wynn was decided the way it did, it ignored the fact, or at least mentioned the fact, that other cases like Waltz versus Tax Commission, Mueller versus Allen, in those cases, standing had been allowed um, sub salento. Uh, and the court said it wasn't going to use them as presidents, but two of the, those two decisions established the legitimacy of state support of religion. In, in Mueller, it was tax deductions, and in Waltz, it was property taxation. Now, Justice Gorsuch has, has, a, uh, has an answer to this. He says, don't worry about, don't worry about losing uh, too much stuff because you're still going to be able to have standing to challenge things. And he says, 
and this is a quote from his opinion, so there would be, by way of example, a public school student compelled to recite a prayer will still have standing to sue, citing school district of Abington Township versus Shemp. Except that that wasn't Shemp. Shemp wasn't compelled recitation of a prayer. The prayers in Shemp were voluntary. If you're going to say that you need compulsion, then the school prayer decisions are wrong or shouldn't have been reached because there was no proper standing. And, and some may be thinking that's a great idea. Let's, let's bring school prayer back. In fact, I think those decisions still remain the decisions that a majority of the pe American people still don't accept. And what's the problem with school prayer in Engel? It, it was accurately described as a 21-word vacuous assertion of piety. But then that leads to the second question, whose prayer? And that's where the real problem has developed. People have killed each other over whose prayer. Uh, if you open up communities by saying there's no standing to build particular monuments to particular religious organizations or have particular religious prayer, then other groups are going to want to get involved. You know, a vote for Harris is a vote for heresy is the way you're going to see elections. And one of the purposes, one of the clear purposes, it seems to me, underlying the Establishment Clause, was trying to eliminate some of the religious divisiveness that the framers were looking, looking to across the pond when they drafted the Constitution. If we gut standing the way that I think the Roberts Court is going, you're going to have that kind of political division take place along religious lines. And to go back to where I started, I'm not sure we need more division in the society right now. Thank you. Mike Schwarzman. So I also want to thank uh, Judge Bea and the Federal Society for including me uh, in, this, um, in this discussion, in this panel about the future of the Establishment Clause in the Roberts Court. Um, uh, I want to begin by, um, by laying out a claim, which is that the court has inverted Establishment Clause doctrine in three main areas. Those are uh, regarding the limits on religious exemptions, as, uh, as Stephanie Barkley laid out. Uh, it has inverted the doctrine with respect to government funding of religious schools, and it's done the same with respect to government religious expression. The result of all of those inversions has been to facilitate a kind of religious favoritism or preferentialism, and more specifically, I think, favoritism toward Christianity, which violates core principles of disestablishment and threatens greater polarization in public attitudes toward religious freedom. So I realize that's a fairly strong claim, especially uh, in this audience, I think. So I, I want to say a few words about each of these doctrinal categories, and, and I'll try to explain uh, my reasoning uh, for, for laying out the claim as I have. Let me start with uh, religious exemptions. Um, after the court's decisions in Hosanna Tabor, in Hobby Lobby, and in Masterpiece Cake Shop, we've now reached the court's high watermark in terms of its protecting religious free exercise. At no point in our prior history has the court ever been more solicitous of religious accommodations, whether under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act or under the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act or under the First Amendment. We are a long way from the conservative decisions of the Berger and Rehnquist courts in the 1980s and 1990s, let alone any court um, prior to those decades. Um, the Berger and Rehnquist courts were deeply skeptical of religious exemptions, culminating, as you well know, in Justice Scalia's decision in employment division against Smith. And now it's clear that at least four justices uh, want to reverse um, Justice Scalia's decision. I think it's fair to say that conservative jurisprudence has been somewhat schizophrenic on the question of exemptions. The Berger and Rehnquist courts almost never granted religious accommodations under the Free Exercise Clause, and those courts showed real concern for the harms that religious exemptions might cause to other people who don't benefit from them. By contrast, the Roberts Court has repeatedly granted religious exemptions, and I think not demonstrated serious concern for whether those exemptions impose real harms on other people. Um, so in the context of religious exemptions, the doctrinal inversion looks something like this. We've gone from a court that grants almost no exemptions and rejects accommodations that harm third parties to a court that is prepared to grant statutory and religious exemptions, even when they result in serious harms uh, to other people. 
The second category I mentioned has to do with government funding of religious schools, and you've already heard something about this. Um, but here, uh, in this context, the, the court's doctrinal inversion is even more striking. The court has moved from a principle of strict separation or no aid, going back to the court's decision in Everson in 1947, and applied admittedly haphazardly through uh, Lemon and its progeny, um, to a principle of neutrality in which the Rehnquist court authorized state funding of religious schools but did not require it uh, in a case um, called Zellman involving school vouchers, as you know. And then to the Roberts Court in Trinity Lutheran, which seems like a short step to requiring state funding of religious uh, education, at least in some circumstances. So the trajectory here is going from no aid to aid is permitted, now to aid is required. Um, in Locke v. Davey, Chief Justice Rehnquist refused to hold that the Free Exercise Clause required funding of religious education, and his view was in part based on federalism values. But those values are, at this point, completely absent from view in these uh, funding cases. Um, I, I think it, it will be interesting to see whether this happens, but I suspect some enterprising originalist, someone who values local government, at some point will start to ask questions about whether Justice Thomas's federalism approach uh, to the Establishment Clause has something to say about this, whether it, it makes sense under a federalism conception of establishment, even with respect to its historical understanding to require states uh, to engage in funding of religious activities of religious institutions, but I think we haven't seen that argument out in a serious way just yet. Um, the last issue is with respect to religious expression, and of, of course we have, uh, we have the Bladensburg Cross case as our most um, recent and salient example. But here too we have a long line of cases from the Warren, Berger, and Rehnquist courts limiting government religious speech. At this point, I think it's not clear anymore what those limits uh, are, if there are any. I mean, if the state can put up a 40-foot Latin cross, the central symbol of Christianity, then the Establishment Clause is no real obstacle to putting the state's imprimatur and prestige behind the majority religion in this country. Still, moving from restricting government speech to allowing it is not a total inversion. Right? That only gets you part of the way around. To do a full 180, you'd have to have a Supreme Court decision that said that the government was required to have some form of religious expression. And that, you might think, is unlikely. But we've heard already on this panel a claim that removing religious symbols would be an expression of hostility toward religion. And we know from Masterpiece Cake Shop that animus or hostility toward religion, a violation of a principle of religious neutrality, is in conflict with uh, First Amendment's uh, religion clauses. If that's right, and if removing religious symbols is animus or hostility toward religion, that sounds a lot like we have to keep religious symbols that are already existing um, in order to avoid hostility under the Free Exercise Clause, the court would be in a position to demand that the state continue um, to support religious symbols. That would be quite a striking inversion of Establishment Clause principles. So that's three inversions, right? From no religious exemptions to requiring exemptions that harm others, from no funding to requiring funding of religious institutions, from limits on government expression to almost no limits, um, and possibly to requiring government religious expression. And I think that these inversions facilitate a kind of religious preferentialism, a kind of favoritism toward the majority religion in this country. Um, in the funding uh, context, the likely beneficiaries are going to be religious majorities with political power to set the terms of funding pro uh, programs. Um, with respect to government expression, I think a 40-foot cross tells you more or less all you need to know. And in, in with respect to exemptions, the main beneficiaries here, again, are going to be uh, members of, uh, of um, religious groups that receive some solicitude from, from the courts. I want to mention one last case that colors this analysis and that hasn't been mentioned uh, on this panel just yet, but that I think looms quite large for thinking about whether the court is serious about protecting religion and religious liberty in an even-handed way. And that case is Trump v. Hawaii, which is the travel ban case, in which the court sanctioned the most egregious example of official religious animus in its recent history, and perhaps ever. If you think about the history uh, and the Establishment Clause as embracing a historical approach, there's no history of presidents expressing animus toward a religious group in the way that we have seen. When compared with the solicitude that the court has shown religious believers, and especially uh, members of um, Christian denominations in Hobby Lobby, in Masterpiece, and in American Legion, the contrast in Trump v. Hawaii could not be more stark. That case, I would argue, remains a stain on the Roberts Court 
and it will be a great source of skepticism about the willingness of this court to take seriously and to treat fairly the demands of religious minorities. Uh, I can't pass on, on uh, the symbol of the Federalist Society, which is the silhouette of James Madison, and I'm reminded of his words in the Memorial and Remonstrance, uh, where he wrote in paragraph nine, instead of holding forth an asylum to the persecuted, it is, and he's talking here about the proposed Virginia assessment, a signal of persecution. It degrades from equal rank of citizens all those whose opinions and religion do not bend to the legislative authority. Distant as it might be in the present form from the Inquisition, it differs only in degree. The one is a first step, the other a last in a career of intolerance. I think the court has a long way to go to show that it's unwilling uh, to, to permit that beacon of intolerance. These cases suggest a kind of preferentialism um, which it will have to do uh, much more work to dispel. Thanks. Thank you very much. I would now like to uh, open the uh, discussion so that individual members can ask others questions and back and forth. So we'll start with Luke. Great. Love to respond briefly both to Micah and, and Bill. And with, with Micah, I, I'm surprised at, at how much we agree. I mean, I think the court has moved on exemptions from uh, forbidding them to, in many cases, requiring them. It has moved on funding from no aid to sometimes requiring neutral aid. And it has moved on symbols from trying to stamp them out to leaving room for them. I think we just disagree on whether it's a good thing or not. And you call it religious favoritism. Uh, I, I think it's actually a manifestation of religious neutrality in a good way. So for example, we talked about uh, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, where the City of Philadelphia is trying to shut down Catholic social services, which for over 100 years has provided, helped recruit loving families for foster children. And when the government shuts them down, despite the fact that there are 29 other private uh, adoption and foster care agencies in the city that willingly serve LGBT couples, uh, that's not neutrality. Uh, when it shuts them down, that's hostility toward religion. And when the government allows different private agencies to provide all the same services to all the various families that might want to do foster care, that's actually neutral. So uh, requiring a government exemption there is a form of neutrality. Uh, same with funding. Uh, Trinity Lutheran is an example. When the government provides a scholarship program and poor families can use scholarships at both religious and non-religious schools, that's a form of neutrality. The government is not influencing private religious choice about where to go to school. Uh, but when the government shuts down scholarships only for religious organizations and gives scholarships to, to secular schools, that actually influences religious choice. It pushes people towards secular schools, so it's not neutral. And then same with symbols. Uh, the government occupies a lot of land in this country. And if the government removes all religious symbols from public land in the country, uh, that speaks volumes about religion. It says religion is somehow distasteful or, or shouldn't be welcome in a public place. Uh, by contrast, when government property kind of mirrors the level of religiosity in the private square, uh, that is actually neutral. So allowing religious symbols to be maintained in the public square and treating them like a natural part of human culture is actually a form of neutrality. I think maybe one, one place I would take issue is where you say we've reached the high water mark of religious exemptions. Uh, I think I have good news for everyone. I think we're going to actually go even higher and see some very good decisions in the coming years. So look forward to it. Professor Barkley. I'll, I'll echo, uh, I, I loved what Bill was saying about the importance of these conversations, and so I'm really grateful that both Bill and Micah are willing to be part of these conversations. I wanna pick up where uh, Micah was talking about the Virginia assessment and Madison's important words about our country being one where we have tolerance for minority religious groups and that we are, are not facilitating and allowing persecution towards these groups. And this is a principle on which both Micah and I absolutely agree. But I also want to take us back a little bit to some of our history as far as lessons that we have learned about the country when we've gotten that wrong. Um, 
And this was in the twin flag salute cases of Gobitis versus Barnett. And in Gobitis, there was an 11-year-old boy who um, decided that his Jehovah Witness religious beliefs would prevent him from saluting the flag. At this time, we're a nation on the brink of World War II in the 1940s. And because of that, his teacher first tried to physically force his hand up. Um, the salute at the time looked like this. And he was able to keep his hand in his pocket. But as a result of that, he was expelled. His family's uh, grocery store was threatened with mob violence, and they were boycotted. That case made its way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court was asked, uh, they, they were essentially asking for a religious exemption um, from this requirement that was applying to all the students that they engage in this flag salute. And the court said, this is an issue of national importance where we really need to instill patriotism, and we can't afford immunity for dissidents, is the words that the court used. And so they said, no to that religious exemption request. And after that, Professor Noah Feldman at Harvard has written about how it was as though the Supreme Court declared open season on these religious groups. And there were uh, FBI reports of fatalities, there were churches burned to the ground, there were Jehovah Witness individuals who were force-fed castor oil and, and marched through the street of a town. And just a few years later, the Supreme Court took an almost identical case in Barnett, and the Supreme Court essentially said, we got it wrong. We got it deeply wrong. And there's no fixed star in our constitutional jurisprudence more clear than the idea that government cannot decide what is orthodox in religious beliefs and in speech. And I'm uh, paraphrasing, but that's, uh, those words from Justice Jackson are some of my favorite. And so this early case in the 1940s where we were granting a religious exemption is an example, I think, of the way in which we protect minority religious beliefs through religious exemptions. The majority views are going to be baked into the general laws that we often have. The, the majority religious views are often not going to collide with a, a lot of the, the general laws that apply to everyone else. But the less popular, the less known religious beliefs, those are the ones that need more protection. And as far as uh, the point about our, our country's schizophrenic history with respect to religious exemptions. I think it's important to think of that in context, generally a broader context of our country's history of figuring out how to protect um, constitutional rights generally. Uh, we had some fits and starts as a country. We didn't even have incorporation against the states um, of a lot of these fundamental rights <clears throat> until into the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Strict scrutiny wasn't developed until 1963. We did have that ex early example um, of Gobitis. There's another case in the 1940s of Murdoch. Another Burger case providing a really important religious exemption is Wisconsin v. Yoder in 1972. Uh, and in many ways, w what we saw prior to this court was a retreat from that, what I think thankfully was a temporary retreat. Um, and I think that the way in which the court has reinvigorated the, the protection of religious minorities is, is a good thing. And this dates even all the way back to our country's founding with an important case that Professor Michael McConnell has written about called People v. Phelps, where we provided a judicial religious exemption as early as 1813. Thank you. Good, Bill. By the way, ter terrific comments. I could spend the rest of the week responding <laughs> to a lot of what's going on. I'll do it real, I'm gonna try to do it relatively relatively quickly. With respect to Luke and the idea of neutrality, um, I actually am not problematic with a lot of the funding decisions that have taken place if they treat him equally. But there's a reason why we have an Establishment Clause. The Establishment Clause isn't neutral. If we want to start our, our prayer in the school every day and not make it a prayer and say, Adam Smith, we acknowledge our dependence upon the, uh, the invisible hand, we can do it. But the, but, the, but the framers took religion off the table with respect to establishment, and why? And I think the answer is because they understood, and this was explained in Engel, that when the prize of government is out there, religions are gonna compete for that. And if religions compete for that, that doesn't lead to a stable society. It leads to, it leads to the problems that they witnessed in Europe. So, so they took the establishment prize off the table to minimize that kind of conflict. And what we're seeing now is a debate over that. If, uh, to go to a free speech case, in the Abrams case, Justice Holmes talked about why is it that people want to censor? And the answer is if you really believe something, you want to enforce it. 
If you really believe your religion is the right religion, this is not nefarious, nothing about it, you might want a symbol to your religion. The problem is somebody else is going to believe that about their religion, and then if we start fighting about that in the political, in the political marketplace, then it's the kind of division along religious lines that I think the framers were, um, were wary about. With respect to exemptions, uh, Stephanie, Stephanie uh, made a great point because her argument about protecting minorities, and, and we sometimes forget this, the, the, uh, the exemption regime was Justice Brennan's regime. Uh, it was Justice Scalia who stepped in and put an end to it. Um, there are a lot of reasons to debate exemptions back and forth, but one of the questions is if you're really talking about protecting minorities, will that exemption regime, if it's adopted, really work? Take, for example, the cases out there right now when people want exemptions against federal laws for shielding immigrants. Uh, is that going to be up? Are we going to create exemptions for that? I mean, are there going to be a lot of cases coming not necessarily from the kind of case that, that Luke talked about, but coming from the left with respect to exemptions. And there's a problem as to how fairly those things are going to be enforced. So, um, you know, it, it's not an easy decision in either way. And the interesting thing about exemptions is that I think there are a lot of strong conservatives and a lot of strong liberals that think exemptions a good idea, and a lot of strong conservatives and a lot of strong liberals that think it does, it's not a good idea. It's not one that breaks down on political lines. Micah, do you want to? I'll just follow up on that to say, when I, when I mentioned the schizophrenia with respect to religious exemptions, all I really mean here is that Justice Scalia took one view, and most of the conservatives on the Supreme Court, maybe not all of them, will we'll have to see, um, take a different view. And I, I don't think there's any bad faith on either side of that. I think they just had different understanding of the free exercise clause and different priorities. Uh, I think Justice Scalia viewed the question mainly in rule of law terms and thought, Look, if you can challenge the law just because you have a religious motivation, um, that's going to lead to all, all kinds of problems, problems uh, of anarchy with respect to enforcement of the law, and also um, it's going to put into the hands of judges having to balance religious claims of religious conscience against state interests, and he thought that was, that was problematic. Um, there's a lot more confidence on this court that that balancing can be struck by judges, uh, in part perhaps because of its uh, experience with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And I, but it's interesting to mark the transition. I mean, I think when social conservatives were fairly secure, the question of mandatory constitutional exemptions was not as pressing. And now that that security is gone and there's legislation pushing um, against, the, uh, against the religious views of many denominations in this country, now all of a sudden on the right, religious exemptions have um, an importance that they simply didn't have in the 1980s and 1990s. It's not to say there weren't conservative thinkers in. In, in, in that time period who, uh, you know, who favored accommodations. There certainly were, right? Mike McConnell was writing these articles pr promoting religious accommodations um, at the same time that Justice Scalia was, was deciding against them. Um, but again, I, I, I think the cultural politics of exemptions has shifted considerably. Let me just make one last point about the question of neutrality. Um, you can ask questions about neutrality in all three of the contexts that I um, discussed with respect to funding, with respect to uh, exemptions, and with respect to government religious expression. But on that last point, on expression, there's nothing neutral about a 40-foot tall Latin cross. It's not a neutral symbol. When the case came up in Salazar, there was an exchange with a Jewish lawyer representing the ACLU, Peter Eliasberg, and Justice Scalia, and Scalia said, of course the cross represents the word at who aren't, who aren't Christian. And I realize I'm in a dissenting view here, and now as a matter of law in dissent, but Scalia was wrong about that, and people in the courtroom laughed in response. It's simply not the case that the cross represents all the war dead, and has never been the case. That's not the history. And, and if that's a signal of how the court is going to understand neutrality, like then again, as I said, the court has a lot of work to do, especially when you look across other cases, and here especially the travel ban, and don't see neutral application of the court's understanding of religious freedom. The animus doctrine at a masterpiece is a razor thin trigger in terms of generating strict scrutiny for when the, uh, there has been official hostility. And in the travel ban, nothing, right? The court sanctions animus, again, like we've never seen. When I look across those cases and I ask, 
do I think that this court has embraced a, a serious principle of religious neutrality? I think it's really hard to make that case. Now, uh, I've, got a, I've got a couple of questions to, to put to the panel because um, I'm in a business where we try to figure out what the law is and how to apply it, right? And, and one of the questions I have uh, is, I, I took down a note that um, I think it was uh, uh, Bill Marshall that uh, mentioned that Justice Kennedy had uh, zeroed in as to what the interest was, which was entitled to protection under the First Amendment, as the fear of social stigmatization. Right? But later on in town of Greece, he sort of made it clear that he wasn't so involved he wasn't so uh, conscious about offensiveness. Offensiveness wasn't enough to give standing, or, to, or at least on the substance of the case. He was talking about coercion. Now, do you see a, a, a difference in, in, in that, uh, Bill? Uh, it, 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 do you see a movement by Justice Kennedy from perhaps the person who feels offended by being thought to be not a member of the in-group to saying that's not enough to, to, to uh, invoke a uh, First Amendment claim. You've got to show that you're being coerced to do something. See it? Oh, I completely understand. The, the, one, the one salient issue that I think ACS and the Federal Society have agreed upon is Justice Kennedy's inconsistency from one opinion to another. <laughs> uh, um, in, the, uh, in the particular, I mean, obviously one took place in a school uh, Lee versus Weissman, where he was concerned about the ostracization, and he didn't accept the coercion argument in the uh, in the in the town of Greece case. I think he's saying that you're dealing with adults there. There's not the same sort of coercive pressure, even though the people are appearing before a board that they might have that might be making decisions over some of their complaints. But yeah, I mean, I don't think he was particularly consistent in his view of what constituted coercion and what didn't. Another issue that comes up pretty frequently is the application of the ministerial exception. In Hosanna Tabor, of course, we had somebody who was, who was a card-carrying minister, let's say. The, the bureaucracy of the church had named that person as a, as a minister. Um, we have some cases where a regular school teacher in a Catholic school does have to um, give a religious class. That's part of her class, just like mathematics or history or whatever. But when she's giving that, does she uh, take on the cloth of a minister, um, or is she teaching a, a course in uh, comparative religions? Um, does, is she indoctrinating, or is she educating? What do you think about that? You're asking me? Yeah. Ah, Socratic method. My students, my <laughs> students would be happy to, and some of them are in here. Uh, <laughs> so they're, they're cheering you on, Judge Bea. Um, you know, the, uh, I think these are one of those very difficult decisions. I mean, one of the things that's left open by Hosanna Tabor is how you determine when somebody is a minister or not. Is it going to be self-defining? I think Justice Thomas just th thinks you should defer. I think uh, Fred Geddix, uh, Stephanie's colleague from BYU, thinks that you really need to take a, a close look at what constitutes a minister or not. In that case, it was a teacher who uh, primarily taught secular kinds of courses, but also involved with it. Um, I can't give you a clear line. I don't think the court gave us a clear line on that. I do think, I do think uh, it's no surprise that, that the court found a ministerial exemption. I think that's appropriate that they did, mm -hmm. but I can't give you a, a, clear, a clear line of demarcation, sorry. I'd like to open it up to the questions of, go ahead. I was just gonna speak to that very briefly. I mean, Hosanna Tabor, that was a nine to zero decision by the Supreme Court saying the government can't interfere with a, a religious organization's choice of its leaders. And what you see in that decision was, a, a, again, a self-consciously historical approach where Chief Justice Roberts, in writing that opinion, looked at the history of the Establishment Clause, including two of the elements I mentioned, government control over religious doctrine and government selection of religious leaders, and said that the ministerial exception was actually required by both clauses, not only the Free Exercise Clause, but also the Establishment Clause. I think that ruling also is a real uh, 
uh, difficulty for the third party harms argument that uh, Micah has occasionally made because you have a fourth grade teacher and she's losing her job. Uh, a very significant harm to her and yet not only is that harm not a violation of the Establishment Clause, it's actually required under the Establishment Clause and you get there through historical analysis, understanding what an establishment was at the time of the founding, that government control over ministers and over doctrine. Good. So one thing that I think is tempting to do in the Establishment Clause context is just sort of have reference to some abstract high level concept as, as the be all or end all of how we're gonna decide these cases. That's, that's what Lemon was doing. Um, I, I loved an oral argument when Justice Gorsuch said that it's essentially been described as the dog's breakfast, which we don't really like, but also um, he sort of asked the attorneys in oral argument, it sounds like you might be proposing potential tests that just take us back to another version of the dog's breakfast and they're equally malleable or, or difficult to administer in any sort of predictable way. And I think coercion is an important um, consideration of the Establishment Clause in certain contexts. If we're, if we're coercing uh, someone to participate in religious practices that, that they don't want to participate in, for example. That's a great example where I think coercion would be an Establishment Clause problem. But I don't think the Establishment Clause is limited to coercion. There's an example cited in the Hosanna to Board decision about when religious groups we're reaching out to James Madison asking for, for him to resolve some religious questions for them about their, their doctrine and their structure. And M Madison said, that's, that's not something that we as government are allowed to do, even when it was permissive. Uh, and this was something that we saw in some of our corpus linguistics results as well, is that sometimes there was, especially for the established church, they welcomed the government interference with what they were doing, because there were a lot of nice perks that came with that. And, and yet that is still a problematic establishment. I think neutrality has a similar gravitational pull where we just want to say, it, it, turn to that as sort of the BL and Is it neutral? Is it not? Um, and I think as Micah and Luke demonstrate, neutrality unmoored from a specific set of facts or a, a specific hallmark of the establishment can be really malleable. I mean, neutrality is going to be in the eye of the beholder. And I think that's why it's important to look at uh, if we're in the funding context, is the government being neutral with respect to uh, providing equal opportunity and equal access to funding? It's a much more concrete question than just the idea of neutrality um, in a vacuum. The last thing I'll say, though, about um, how is it possible that religious monuments or, or religious symbols on government property can ever be neutral? I think, again, in isolation, if that's the only monument that we're thinking about on government property that doesn't, that doesn't look neutral, even to the, uh, to the extent that that's an important test, and I, um, I sort of push back on the idea that it is. But when you think about all of the different things that the government has on its property, this was relevant in another case before the Ninth Circuit with a statute called uh, Montana Jesus. There was a statue of Montana on ski slopes that were owned by the government. People really loved skiing down the mountain and jumping to high five Jesus on their way down. It was a really important part of that ski slope. But um, a lot of evidence <laughs> in that case pointed out the wider range of quirky monuments and things that the government allows to be on its property. And so then if we're saying only religious monuments, can't be on government property. That looks far from neutral, even to the extent that's an important consideration. So I, I will say a word about Hosanna Tabor uh, because I think it links up to this last point that you're making about broadening our view to look at other uh, types of um, speech that the government might support. In Hosanna Tabor, the court said that, uh, that churches receive special solicitude under the First Amendment. That is, religious organizations are picked out by the religion clauses of the First Amendment for special treatment. And churches get very special protection in the ministerial exception. If you run a business, you, you know, especially if you're in an HR department, you don't get anything close to the kinds of immunities from anti-discrimination law that a church does, um, especially when it's hiring ministers. So churches are very special types of entities, um, at least with respect to the ministerial exception. But when we turn around and ask whether the government can fund those entities um, or whether states are required to fund those entities, then the claim is something like churches are just like all other organizations. They're not special in any way. Right? They have to be treated just like everyone else. And so with respect to exemptions, it looks like religious organizations and religious believers more generally are very special. When it comes to disestablishment, they have to be treated like everything else. Right? Religious symbols are just like other kinds of symbols that the state might support. There's nothing distinctive about them. 
And this is really strange. Right? This is a kind of double standard that is not easy, I think, to explain. If religious groups are special for some purposes, you might think, well, they'll be special for other purposes, too. I certainly think our framers had views like this. Madison thought religious obligations had distinctive force, um, but he also thought uh, that, that there were reasons to disestablish uh, religious views. Let me just say one more word about, uh, about third-party harms, um, which I, I think is, is a kind of cutting-edge doctrinal topic and still not all that well litigated or understood. Imagine this. Imagine you work for a for-profit company, and that company comes to you and says, we're not going to pay your Social Security benefits anymore. We have religious objections to paying for Social Security. And now I ask the question, do you think that you would be harmed if a court said that business is entitled not to pay those benefits to you? And I think most of us would say, yeah, that's a setback to my interests. That's costly to me. It's harmful to me. And in a case um, under the Burger Court in the 1980s in the United States against Lee, um, a unanimous court basically said the same thing. Right? You can't deny someone their Social Security benefits just because you have a religious objection to paying Social Security taxes. When religious exemptions or when religious beliefs would harm other people in a serious way, that becomes a question that the court has to take into consideration, both under the Free Exercise Clause and under the Establishment Clause. We, we have to think about that problem, and I, I suspect that really what's going to happen here is the, the courts aren't going to dismiss this question out of hand. It would be completely untenable to do that. The question is going to be how much harm are courts willing to allow when it comes to religious exemptions, not whether the, uh, the religion clauses have anything to say or not to say about it. Of course they have something to say about it. <clears throat> One last question from uh, somebody who's in the pits all the time uh, on this issue. Um, we are increasingly uh, told that the first thing we have to consider, whether or not it's brought up in the briefs, is standing. And one of the issues that, that, that I see uh, causing some uh, doubt is this concept of dignitary, dignitary injury. Um, it's very difficult for me to put an objective um, definition on that and be able to, to say this is a dignitary injury and this is not even a dignitary injury. Maybe you could help me on that. I get asked this question a lot now, what counts as a dignitary harm? And the example I like to give is to distinguish material harms from dignitary harms is um, suppose I run a bus service and, and I think I'm obligated on religious grounds, and this doesn't happen anymore, thankfully, in our country, or extremely rarely, but I think I'm required by religious, my religious tenets to discriminate on racial grounds. And I say, look, I'm prepared to let people of a racial minority ride on my bus, so there's no material harm to them, right? They can get from point A to point B on my bus. But I say, in order to be consistent with my beliefs, the people who are members of racial minorities, they have to sit in the back. I think we all intuitively understand that requiring someone to do that imposes a dignitary harm on them. It denies their status as an equal citizen. It's not about getting from point A to point B, it's about how you get from point A to point B, and that matters to our dignity as citizens. And I, I, I don't know how better to explain it than that, but I, I think that's a lot of what's going on here. It's a good here. example. Bill? All right. Now's the time that we're going to uh, open it up to questions from the audience. And um, if you just step up to the microphone and state your name, and then please state a question, not a statement. Good evening, Nate Kennard from the Chattanooga Bar. Thank you to the panel for excellent uh, presentation. My question is for Professor Schwartzman. Uh, I think- Please speak up. My apologies. My, I think the degree to which the Roberts Court looks to be particularly solicitous of you know, the majority religion, Christianity versus others, is to some degree a matter of perception. And the example you gave, which shows a, a different treatment is the Trump versus Hawaii case versus Masterpiece Cake Shop. But I think of the Holt versus Hobbes case where the court was very solicitous of the views of the Muslim prisoner. Uh, what's your response to that? Does that somewhat negate um, a perception that the court treats uh, minority religions less favorably? Thank you. 
I, I love the Holby Hobbs case. It's a, it's a great example for the question that you're asking, and you're right, it's a good counterexample. Um, it was preceded in litigation by a case that the UVA Supreme Court Clinic, I have to give some kind of shout out to UVA, um, <laughs> a case called Iron Thunder Horse that was CVSG, and I think it helped to tee up Iron Thunder Horse. Um, look, at the end of the day, we're just gonna have to see more cases and a run of cases. I'm not optimistic that Iron Thunder Horse um, is, is gonna be the, de the definitive marker here. I mean, I'm a little worried that it's an example of tokenism. Um, but it was an important case because there was a clear split in the circuits uh, about how to, how to implement strict scrutiny in the prison context. So I, I, don't, I don't disagree that it's an important decision and it's a decision that affirms the free exercise rights of a Muslim prisoner. And there are many religious minorities affected by our lupa and we are seeing huge numbers of our lupa cases. They, they vastly outnumber any other type of free exercise case throughout the country and a half for more than a decade. I think this is something that's not all that well appreciated publicly about our religious free exercise regime. Enormous amount of litigation is happening in the prison, so I don't underestimate that decision. Next question over there. Uh, Clark Forsyth, American Jedi for Life. Um, to follow up on Professor Marshall's point, I wanted to ask uh, how much religion do the framers take off the table by writing the establishment clause rather than the support clause or the favor clause or the recognized clause. Anyone want to tackle that one? I'm not sure I understand your question. I think you well, this is an originalist could, could you conference, the question, so please? I'm asking an originalist question, yeah. which is uh, you said that the framers took religion off the table. And I wanted to ask how much religion did they take off the table by writing the establishment clause rather than the support clause or the recognized clause or the favor clause. Well, yeah, okay, uh, thank you. Um, I think they took off the table that, I think what they were trying to do, and you know, how much we want to figure out what establishment means, and it was interesting to me that Virginia, uh, shortly after the enactment of the First Amendment, didn't want churches to be able to own property or be incorporated because they thought that that was improper support of of religion. So one of, the, one of the problems with history is we all know that history can be interpreted in multitudes of ways. The point that I was making wasn't that all religion was taken off the table, but that the, re, that the framers were clearly concerned about the idea that religions would compete for government favor. And that's the problem that I think that they were worried about and the divisiveness that comes when you have religions compete for, gover for uh, government favor. I'm not in favor of taking down old symbols. I think that Breyer's point that taking down old symbols uh, does, does uh, show some hostility is an accurate one. I think we aren't gonna change the name of Corpus Christi. We aren't gonna change the name of Los Angeles, although we might want to because it's clearly not the city of angels. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, you know, going forward, I think there's a natural dynamic that if you see a town supporting somebody else's religion, you're going to want them to support yours. Or if a p new political majority takes over in a town uh, that's of a different religious faith than the previous majority, you're going to take down one monument and put up another one. And if we, uh, and the standing cases, I think, you know, standing cases are just letting it go to court. But if we don't have any of those kind of constraints at all, I think we're going to have the political divisiveness that, that uh, the framers were worried about. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. Next. Uh, Jordan Lawrence. I work for Alliance Defending Freedom. And Professor Marshall, I, was, I wanted to bring up the very topic that, and you just said, well, of course, the city of Los Angeles couldn't get sued to change its name. And you made an appropriate joke, I would say. But the way that Justice Ginsburg wrote her dissenting opinion, if that had been the majority opinion, that something only has one meaning, and that you can't make a cross into a secular monument by saying it's dedicated to veterans, then to me, I think uh, you would have lawsuits saying St. Paul, Minnesota violates the Establishment Clause. The rainbow flags at the Stonewall uh, National Monument uh, can't have two meanings. They mean uh, Noah and Genesis and the gay rights movement, you know, they can't say there's two meanings. That seems like the same logic. So I don't understand why that would ne not be that we would see all these kinds of lawsuits against, you know, Providence, Rhode Island, and Corpus Christi, et cetera. 
Well, look, I don't, I, I, I'm not buying into Justice Ginsburg's theory on, on, on the particular point you're making. I, do, I think I, we, we have a problem in this area. That I don't think there's many areas that are as beset by inherent contradiction <coughs> as the religion clauses. Mm -hmm. The First Amendment itself seems to require special support for religion in one clause and, and a, a special disability for religion in another clause. I think that's what Micah was referring to before. We have a cultural history that's deeply embedded with all kinds of, uh, of religious symbolism. Uh, when we were talking about this in my class the other day and we had some real ardent separationists, I said, okay, we'll meet class on Thanksgiving because that's obviously unconstitutional to have it as a national holiday. They, they quickly retreated from that, by the way. <laughs> Um, so you, 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 your point is right, but I do think there is a point that, that the court has been alluding to in trying to work out all these years, that at some point when you enter into new kinds of symbols and new kinds of, new kinds of traditions or whatever, it creates the kind of problems that don't exist with things that have been around for a long time. Justice Alito's opinion seems to be alluding to that in the, uh, in the American Legion case. The, the Ten Commandments case has had that before. Um, but when you create it, and, uh, and the distinction between McCreary and, and Van Orden on that, I think expressed that as well. And I think it, we, we're, we aren't going to have the clear lines of demarcation that I think Luke would like us to have, um, because I don't think it's a particularly clear area to figure out a, a, a absolute bright line. Well, maybe I should ask Professor Schwarzman if he agrees with that, because I, yeah, I take it that you agreed with what uh, <laughs> Justice Ginsburg said. From Breyer yeah. to Ginsburg. <laughs> I don't think Ginsburg was saying that a, that a religious symbol can't have multiple meanings. I, was say, I think she meant that symbol didn't have multiple meanings, and she's right about that. That symbol didn't have multiple meanings. It had one meaning when it was put up. We know that because at the time it was put up, and this is a nice originalist point, um, there were alternative religious symbols for people who were veterans and were dead from World War I. If you were a Jewish veteran of World War I, you didn't have a cross on your tombstone, you had a star, and there were available means to select if you were choosing tombstones at the time. And I think that was common knowledge. So I think her point is just about this particular symbol. I don't think you'll see Parade of Horribles, to city names and so on. I think it's understood that some symbols can be secularized over time, but not this one. Luke? Yeah, I, I think Bill's, going back to Bill's uh, soliloquy, I think it really illustrates what the difference is on this side of the podium and that, and, and that he, he seems to view the uh, two religion clauses as intention or conflict with each other. So the free exercise clause is like there to help religion and the establishment clause is there to kind of uh, make the government a little bit skeptical of religion. And that's really the view uh, of the lemon test, you know, it, it, interpreting the establishment clause not to have any sort of meaning rooted in history, but just a, a general kind of roving mandate to restrict religion in the public square. But that would be real news to the founders because the founders viewed the two religion clauses as working together toward the sim same goal of reducing government control over religion. And when you understand what an establishment actually was at the time of the founding, those elements that Professor McConnell has identified, uh, those, those types of government practices were exercise of government control over religion in very specific ways and uh, if you restrict the government from that, and you also restrict the government from interfering with free exercise, you're leaving religion free uh, to flourish by its own merits. And so I think that's, that's where the difference comes in. It also affects uh, views on religious symbols. So we talk about uh, divisiveness and standing. And really, in this area of the law, you know, religious symbols were not a concern at the founding. The first Supreme Court decision addressing religious symbols under the Establishment Clause was Stone v. Graham in 1980. We had almost 200 years where the Supreme Court was simply not in the business of policing religious symbols. You didn't end up with crosses on top of City Hall. Uh, what you ended up with was sort of a, a, a mirror. The public square kind of reflected the amount of religiosity in the private square. Uh, and so the Lemon Test actually promotes more divisiveness, more social conflict in this area by generating these kinds of lawsuits that lead to uh, bitter strife over what were for almost 200 years just innocuous religious symbols. Next question. Uh, Reed Smith, Christian Legal Society. Uh, this kind of follows up on Jordan's question. Uh, in, in particular, Professor Schwartzman, 
What is your limiting principle here? Like, with, you say that the Latin cross is clearly a religious symbol. Um, are we now going to go into Arlington National Cemetery and if maybe if we aren't going to desecrate each of the gravestones, we might desecrate some of the other freestanding crosses there. And if you're going to go to a size issue, you may have noticed we have a relatively large obelisk here in the middle of Washington, D.C., which also is, is, has its origins in religious symbol, symbolism. So I'm just kind of wondering where, where the limiting principle is here. Thank you. I, it's, a, it's a fair question. Uh, I, I don't think anyone has any objection to selecting religious symbols for individual grave markers as in Arlington. My father was a military chaplain for most of his career uh, and was the chaplain in Arlington for a while. I, I can't imagine. I, I just don't think that uh, there's any serious establishment clause objection and, it, and I don't see anyone on the court uh, including Ginsburg and Sotomayor staking out a position that would conflict with uh, those types of decisions. It still leaves open the question what the principle is. And I think, in a way, I think American Legion's right. It's all about social meaning. Justice Alito says uh, determining social meaning is difficult, but he, he knows what social meaning is. And, he, and the way you know he knows it is because uh, he thinks it's quite clear that removing the monument would be a signal of hostility. Why? because it's clear that some people would be offended by that. And when you ask what's the role of offense in the Establishment Clause, we say oh, it has no role, but it does have a role, right? It signals, or it could signal anyway, hostility. So I, I guess I, I want to turn back the question to some extent. I think it's all about social meaning, and there's no way really of escaping that. It's about that question on both sides. And I also then would want to, want to know what, what's the limiting principle for the court, a historical principle? That doesn't really tell us very much. We can allow crosses on Capitol buildings. We didn't have them historically. Will we have them now? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. No. I think we have time for one more question before we uh, adjourn. It, I'm Sam Wright, I'm retired Navy, JAG. Uh, if, if there's a conflict or tension between the free exercise clause and the establishment of religion causes, the free exercise clause still Trump in the mili in the federal government spends hundreds of millions of dollars providing chaplains for military personnel for federal prisoners for uh, patients in VA hospitals but if we didn't provide that you know where would those people go to worship is that uh, are the chaplain services safe from this kind of attack anybody want to tackle that one I don't want to say I grew up uh, the beneficiary of an unconstitutional practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, do you think you did? <laughs> no, no, I think it's constitutional. I'd like you all to thank this uh, distinguished panel. <laughs> and we are adjourned. Thank you very much.